Hello, my name is Candy Tupertaller, and I'm the Director of Physical Therapy at Craig Hospital, and I'm going to be speaking today about exoskeleton utilization and clinical integration. And I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I hope that um, you'll get a little from this PowerPoint as well. In terms of objectives, uh, I would like to discuss the clinical integration of powered exoskeletons to date review some case studies utilizing a variety of exoskeletons in the outpatient rehabilitation and at a community fitness center. And then I'd also like to discuss findings from a recent feasibility study that we completed at Craig evaluating exoskeleton use in individuals with spinal cord injury. So when I first walk into a patient's room after they've had a spinal cord injury, the first thing they generally tell me is that I want to walk again. I found this picture on the left from the archives here at Craig. It was a gentleman in 1964 who was learning how to walk again with long leg braces. If you look at the picture on the right, I took this, these pictures just a couple of years ago. And what's starkingly interesting to me is that the technologies between the two pictures, which are over 50 years in apart, are very, very similar. They look almost the same. If you look at the body position of the individuals who are trying to use them, they also look very similar. The arms are held in extension, and we're putting a ton of um, pressure through the shoulders, and then the hips are also in hyperextension. So the reason I show these two pictures is just to demonstrate that the technology to help individuals with motor complete spinal cord injuries walk again really hasn't improved in many, many years. And I, I'm excited about some technologies that are now on the horizon that may make this possible. Um, but if you look at these pictures, this first video, again, is that gentleman who is learning how to walk with KFOs or long leg braces. You can see how difficult it is for him to do that. And then you can also see on the video on the right, this gentleman is walking with a reciprocating gait orthoses. Same kind of idea, the hips and knees are locked out. He's usually his shoulders and um, placing a large uh, physio physiological um, stress on his body in order to be able to do this. So we know that the rejection rates with these types of technologies are very high. So some literature would tell us that about 75% of all long leg braces are actually rejected within the first year of individuals receiving them. And we know this is because of the high en energy expenditure and the significant amount of upper extremity forces that are required um, to safely walk with these types of devices. So what are our options? We can either wait around and hope that somehow the spinal cord just mas magically learns to heal itself, or we can continue progressing with technology. And I think that's where the exoskeletons really come into play. There was an online survey uh, that was completed a couple of years ago, back in 2014, and essentially what they looked at were 354 wheelchair users and 127 healthcare professionals. And what they wanted to understand was what was the most highly rated reason to recommend an exoskeleton at that time, and then also what were the most important design features that would facilitate successful implementation of these technologies. Um, those individuals rated that the most um, important reason to recommend an exoskeleton at that time were for health benefits, and that the four most important design features um, for these technologies were minimization of fall risk, they needed to be comfortable, uh, individuals needed to be able to be independent with putting them on and taking them off, and then the purchase cost needed to be something reasonable that people could pay out of pocket for, because at this point the insurance um, is not uh, supporting them in the United States. So what are our options? Uh, the first option on the market, the first device that was approved by the FDA is called the Rewalk. Um, it's approved for home use for individuals with a spinal cord injury from T7 to L5. You can only utilize crutches using this device. It doesn't allow you to use a walker. The weight capacity is about 220 pounds, and in total it weighs 56 pounds. So you know, I think this was really the first device on the market that has kind of led the way for some of the other personal devices. The next device was the Exo by Exobionics. Um, similar in that it has a weight capacity of 220 pounds. It weighs about 50 pounds. Um, it's been FDA approved for rehab use only. So this is only um, a device that can be used in the clinical setting and cannot be taken home with patients. 
You can either use a crutch, you can either use crutches or a walker with this device. And this was the first device uh, out that allowed both full and variable assist modes. So it allows you to essentially dial up or down um, the lower extremities so that you can meet an individual's ability level, um, even if they're incomplete. So this is, again, a device that's used just in the clinical setting and cannot be taken into the home. The Indigo is uh, a modular exoskeleton, so it comes in five pieces. Uh, it has a significantly lower total weight at 27 pounds. It has a weight capacity that's a little higher at 250 pounds. It has full, full and variable assist modes. So again, the same idea that you can tailor it to somebody's individual ability level and needs. Uh, you can also use crutches and a walker with it. And it is approved um, through the FDA for home use for individuals with a T3 spinal cord injury and below. So this, as a home device, actually has a little bit higher indication for, or has a higher indication for somebody with a spinal cord injury than the Rewalk device, which is also approved for home use. And when we think about emerging devices, uh, the Cyberdyne HAL was approved by the FDA in 2017 for use. Uh, it is also a little bit more lightweight than some of the other heavier exoskeletons that I've previously spoken about. It actually requires some EMG activity in the lower extremities to initiate stepping. So there, we place electrodes on the legs and then it's looking for some sort of a signal uh, that would allow the, that stepping motion to occur. Uh, the company requires that the individual is tethered while they're in the system. So they would either be in an overhead body weight support system over ground or um, in some sort of a treadmill based system that also has body weight support. The middle picture is the Rex, which is not yet FDA approved in the United States. I think although large and pretty heavy, we're excited about the fact that individuals may be able to utilize it without requiring an assistive device, which would require upper extremity function. So maybe even those individuals with high cervical level of in, levels of injury might be able to use something like this. And then finally, the picture on the right is the Exo Atlet, which I know you all are very familiar with. We're excited to be starting a safety and feasibility study with you in the next couple of months and really looking forward to exploring the device and really beginning to understand how it's used and who it might best uh, fit. When we look at the literature in spinal cord injury, uh, overall walking speed is still very slow. So somewhere between 0 0.03 meters per second to 0.45 meters per, per second. The max speed that's been reported in the literature is 0.15 meters per second. So still very slow in comparison to normal walking. Um, anecdotally, people have reported improvements in pain, bowel, bladder function, and spasticity. Subjects generally report they enjoy training in these studies. The metabolic cost of walking has been calculated to be somewhere between 3.5 and 4.3 METs, which is really light to moderate exercise, so not requiring a lot of uh, physiological cost associated with walking. Most individuals in these studies have been able to reach a contact guard or slow, close supervision level. And then efficacy has not yet been demonstrated. So there haven't been any studies that have really compared uh, these uh, types of powered exoskeletons to other forms of locomotor training that we're currently employing in the clinic. And then finally, um, Benson in 2016 found that overall the exoskeleton generally did not meet subjects' high expectations in terms of perceived benefits. Um, they mentioned that it, the, the weight of the devices how much noise they make, and that they weren't really as flexible for things like getting on and off the floor and getting into tight spaces. So definitely need to learn a little bit more about that. The stroke literature has really been focused mainly on the HAL, and this has been these studies have been published in Europe. They found that they're safe, um, that the device is safe uh, to use with individuals with, who've had a CVA. They found equiv equivalent results to traditional training, um, such as gait training interventions. And they've also said that um, maybe patients with subacute injuries might experience added benefit because you can get them more stepping, more dosage of therapy with less um, physical assistance from therapists. So there may be some benefit there. And as I previously said, it's only been clear to use in the United States since 2017 through the FDA.
So the big question that we're all facing is how do we implement these devices clinically and who are they best suited for? When we look at our continuum of care for spinal cord injury, um, we've chosen not to implement them in acute care. Um, we are implementing them a little bit in inpatient rehabilitation, but most um, of the use of the devices really occurs in outpatient rehabilitation and what we would call post-conventional services or health facilities. So programmatically, when somebody tells us they're interested in using an exoskeleton, the first question we ask is, are you looking to buy one for home? Or are you using, or would you like to use one for just health and wellness? If they say they want to purchase one for home, we send them to our outpatient clinic where they can um, bill their insurance for visits that they would use to learn how to use the device. Uh, but at this point in the U.S., there's not an insurance company that's consistently reimbursing for the devices. If they tell us that their goal is just training, health, and wellness, then we refer them to our activity-based um, PEAK program, which I'll talk about. And the PEAK Center is a community-based fitness and wellness center. We, it's, all a, it's a self-pay program, so we don't take any insurance in this particular program. We have exercise specialists and PTs who provide care. Uh, they use a variety of technologies, including the exoskeleton. So we, we um, in the Peak Center, we got the first EXO by ExoBionics delivered in the United States in 2012. To date, we've seen over 150 clients with that device um, with a variety of diagnoses from SCI to traumatic brain injury to MS to ALS. And uh, the far majority of individuals that we have seen do have a spinal cord injury. And the, the majority of those individuals have a motor complete spinal cord injury, so age impairment scale A or B. Here's a case study of a gentleman who has been using the EXO for quite a few years. He has a T3 motor complete injury, and he's been injured over 20 years. He's done over 100 sessions in the peak wellness program, at 72 sessions, he was able to start <clears throat> walking without physical assistance, so able to use his weight shift to trigger those steps and able to achieve a really nice balance point. Um, when you ask him why he's, he's an accountant, so a very smart gentleman, and he comes in two to three times a week to pay to use the exoskeleton. So when I ask him why he continues to do this, he says because it helps decrease the amount of time it takes for his bowel program. He's had um, a limited number of urinary tract infections since he started walking. It hel has helped decrease his spasticity and also gives him a greater feeling of overall health. So he feels like it's just part of his health and wellness routine that he will continue. Second case study is an individual with a T4 age impairment scale injury, so no motor or sensory below uh, the chest level. He actually came into the Peak Center as well. He used an exoskeleton for about 40 sessions and decided that he wanted to purchase one of his own. He purchased a rewalk independently, um, but unfortunately, he doesn't have a companion that can walk with him at home, and he, <clears throat> excuse me, he doesn't have a large enough space that he can walk um, at home either. And the device is pretty heavy, so he's not able to transport it himself. So he actually comes into the, the hospital pays a trainer to walk with him, and he walks four to five days a week from a health and wellness perspective. So again, a different kind of perspective in terms of purchasing one for home, but yet still not being able to truly use it in the home environment. The last case study I have is a gentleman who received a rewalk through a grant. He also has a T4 motor complete injury. <clears throat> he was... Um, he came to Craig and did 28 sessions of walking, of walking training over six weeks. He was able to get to a contact guard assist level at about 16 to 18 sessions. Um, the challenge here is that his wife was his companion, and she was really uncomfortable uh, spotting him in the device. So when they returned to Las Vegas, we actually recommended that they go to a local clinic and continue getting training before they were able to walk independently, just the two of them together. 
As I said earlier, uh, the Indigo is the most recent device that we've added to the Peak Center. Um, so we've had it since 2017. We've seen over 50 clients in the device. Um, we actually have a couple of research studies. Uh, we completed a safety and feasibility study with the device, and then we also um, currently have a bone density study, so looking at individuals with chronic spinal cord injury and what impact walking three times a week has on bone density. Um, in the picture on the right, you can see that the prototype of this device is able to climb stairs, but the FDA, is not have, uh, the FDA has not approved the device for stair climbing in the U.S. yet. It is also, you can, uh, it's augmented with functional electrical stimulation, but that is also not approved for clinical use in the United States yet. And then finally, um, we've talked a little bit about variable assist, so being able to change the parameters um, to meet an individual's needs. So this young lady has a stroke, and we're able to essentially turn up the assistance on her more impaired limb and then decrease the assistance on her less impaired limb. So I think we're really excited about this feature of variable assist and looking for opportunities that it may not only compensate for lost walking, but actually help improve um, somebody's walking ability. So I wanted to just quickly review the multi-center study that we were involved in um, with the Indigo. Essentially, we were just, again, looking at safety and feasibility outcomes for 34 individuals with spinal cord injury who completed the trial. Uh, these individuals did about 26 sessions of actual, tra of actual training with a one-session follow-up phone call. Um, they spent about 45 total hours in training over that uh, time period. And what we found is that there were uh, 66 adverse events um, out, of the out of the 918 walking sessions, with only 11 of those being uh, related to the device. Um, and we also, I think one of the most inter interesting things we found were that um, 22 out of the 34 subjects were able to put the device on independently, and 29 out of the 34 subjects were able to take it off independently. When we look at walking speed, another interesting finding was that there was no difference between indoor and outdoor walking speed, yet walking speed um, showed a, a significant improvement from the midpoint walking speed to the final walking speed. When we look at final indoor and outdoor walking speed, um, individuals with uh, Asian impairment scale A, so motor complete injuries, actually had a little bit higher walking speed than the other categories. Although if you look at the numbers, it was also had the highest number in, in that group. So there could be some impact um, that may not be just related to the impairment scale. In terms of the feasibility discussion, we felt that um, there, the safety objectives were met because there were very limited device-related um, adverse events. The majority of the participants were able to put it on and take it off independently. There were significant improvements in walking speed. However, there was a large variability between midpoint and final evaluations. Some participants were able to reach, reach close to the household walking speeds of 0.4 meters per second. And there was no significant differences between indoor and outdoor walking speed. And the majority of participants were able to reach um, a required supervision level or required minimal assistance for walking. So we've chosen on an inpatient side to implement the exoskeletons as an adjunct to the, the normal therapy day that we're providing. So when a patient and family and, and uh, uh, staff feel that they're appropriate to trial in the exoskeleton, they're referred to a special team that fits and trials the system with. I think overall, from a uh, in terms of take-home points, safety and feasibility has been demonstrated in exoskeleton use in both sp stroke and spinal cord injury. Recent exoskeleton variable assistance options may be beneficial for training walking recovery after stroke and traumatic brain injury. And studies need to be completed to evaluate exoskeletons in, the, in, uh, in comparison to other forms of locomotor training that pro, uh, improve walking recovery, so specifically other types of treadmill training. When we consider clinical integration of this technology, we have to consider the technology cost. Right now, insurance does not cover this in the United States, and it's too costly for most people to pay out of pocket for. There's staffing costs associated with using the in a technology in the clinical environment, 
staff education. The devices need to be easy to use and they need to be durable. And then you have to consider whether or not you're having your primary therapist use the device versus bringing in a special team um, that may be a little bit more efficient in using the device. But in the end, all of these advanced technologies may provide more opportunities to develop alternate uh, models of care, such as health and facilities. So as we wrap up, I think the big question is, from a motor learning perspective, are these devices any better, or are they the same, or maybe even not as effective in helping an individual recover walking after an incomplete injury or stroke or traumatic brain injury? We just don't know yet. Are they ready to be in the home with um, individuals using them independently, or should they only be in the rehabilitation setting for now in the hands of clinicians? And then the financial challenges. You know, a patient, most individuals can't afford to pay $75,000 out of pocket for a home device. So again, this may be a reason that they're not ready to be there yet. While saying all that, I want to also express that I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm excited about whether technology um, how the technology has evolved over the last 10 years, and I'm really excited that it'll continue evolving and hopefully at some point allow people to make a decision whether they want to mobilize in a wheelchair or in an exoskeleton. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention today, and I hope you have a great rest of your conference. All right, thank you. Thank you.